Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Dr. Andrew Kaufman. Dr. Andy has a Bachelor of Science from MIT in Molecular Biology and completed his psychiatric training at Duke University Medical Center after graduating from the Medical University of South Carolina. He spent many years in the medical field and practiced as a forensic psychiatrist and expert witness. When he learned that many of the modern medical practices were harming people and not helping them, he gave up his lucrative medical career and began researching and understanding the relationship between body, mind, and spirit, and how to use nature to heal your own body. Dr. Andy's new practice is spreading truth about the world we live in today and fighting for freedom. He teaches people the vital knowledge that they need to implement true care for themselves and their families at the highest level of consciousness. He now teaches people how to become their own health authority. If you enjoy today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. We hope you enjoy this episode with Paul and Dr. Kaufman, who Paul calls the medical detective. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, we are talking to the man I call the medical detective. It's Andrew Kaufman, MD. I've had the great pleasure of of seeing many video interviews and listening to podcasts with Dr. Kaufman, and I'm really grateful that he is in the world because if you want to hear a man dissect the bullshit with a scalpel and precision, uh, he is the man, and I have seen him give rebuttals to scientists who are criticizing his work, and he certainly returns the justice poetically, beautifully, and technically. So, Dr. Kaufman, welcome to Living 4D. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. It's great to be here. So there's a few things I want to talk to you about. Some of them you've talked about before, but I don't think as much as you've been out there, I still don't think a lot of people have really found you. So my goal today is to expose you to as many people as possible so they can find your website, your other videos, because I think um, I think you bring a lot of sanity to the insanity is how I would put it. And, um, um, you know, though deep thinkers and holistically oriented doctors and therapists around the world find your information and teachings important and thought provoking, I've seen several scientists, doctors, and others that are diametrically opposed to your viewpoints respond in various videos. Your approach is both unique and holistic for an MD. Could you please give some background on how you came to be such an effective medical detective and how you became oriented toward holism instead of reductionism? Wow. Well, that's a really um, interesting question. And uh, of course, I could go into, you know, quite a bit of detail, but I think it is kind of fascinating about what you say of the detective angle and how I approach this material, because although I didn't know this as I was going about my professional life, but I think I had all of these distinct experiences that each taught me um, a skill that I was able to apply to analyze what's going on in the world the last few years. And this, you know, goes back quite far. So first, you know, having my education at MIT, where it was very focused on molecular and cell biology and biotechnology. In fact, I even took a course that we were designing a manufacturing plant for insulin in a third world country. And, you know, we had to come up with the whole process uh, uh, to develop that. So I had that insight. And, you know, many of the kind of famous uh, doctors, Nobel Prize winners like David Baltimore, who've been involved in the pharmaceutical and biotech and virus research, they were actually my professors. So I, I have kind of an interesting understanding of how that world works and what the information is and where it comes from. And then also, I started working in, the, in that industry. So first, I did academic research in the bench uh, in chemistry, protein chemistry. Then I went to work at Biogen, where I did peptide synthesis, um, and I developed a molecular modeling program, which helped me understand about computer modeling. Then I worked at Genzyme in the largest um, 
bioreactor manufacturing facility in the world at that time making a recombinant enzyme. So I understand the genetic technology, like what would produce the mRNA vaccine or GMO technology firsthand. Then after I I did all the, all that work while I was still an undergrad, and then right after I finished, I went to New York and worked for the health department doing AIDS epidemiology research. So now out of the laboratory and out of industry into the public health arena, going to hospitals, clinics, doing um, chart reviews, reporting in the, the CDC database uh, for AIDS cases, and seeing how that world operates and how they keep track of things. And we were, you know, in our division too, we had people working with TB, working with sexually transmitted diseases. So I saw a bit more about the public health system than just related uh, to AIDS itself. But I definitely studied everything about AIDS inside and out at that time, at least from the mainstream viewpoint. And then I kind of switched gears a little bit, went to physician assistant school because I had wanted to go to medical school ultimately. And I looked at that as a reasonable stepping stone at the time. And so when I finished that, I actually went and took a faculty job at the Medical University of South Carolina in their hematology and oncology department. And there I worked mostly with inpatient hematology and bone marrow transplants. So I worked with some of the sickest patients in the hospital because our treatment was to completely destroy their immune system and then give them a transplant immune system um, to hopefully grow back and to eliminate the leukemia, which was the main thing we were doing it for. Um, And we worked with a lot of other blood disorders, but I saw how the medical system actually poisons people and hastens their death. And I also saw the opportunity to connect with people through the dying process and see the humanity of that. And it was that process that actually led me then to go into psychiatry because I decided to go to medical school and become a full-fledged MD. And then, you know, ultimately I chose psychiatry because it was just fascinating seeing the vast array of human behavior. And also I wanted to help with all of the suffering um, because it was very rewarding in the end of life process. So I got involved in that and went to do my training at Duke. And that was very instrumental because just in the first year there, they taught us this thing called a critical appraisal of the literature. And we took individual, you know, medical science, clinical research papers, like a lot of them were antidepressants or antipsychotics related to psychiatry. And we would dissect and criticize those papers and point out all the limitations and flaws and that whatever, could they really say what they said at the end? And what we found is almost always these things were, you know, manipulated, skewed, done by people who didn't truly understand statistics and a variety of problems came about. And ultimately we read this paper. um, I think it was from the, the Green Journal and it was someone had got a Freedom of Information Act request to release all of the FDA data from antidepressants that were submitted by the drug companies, because that was, they don't publish all of these studies. They just submit them to get approval because they never publish a negative study, for example. So if they do a study that shows no benefit for their drug, it will never be published, but it would have to be submitted for an FDA application. So this uh, scientist was able to combine all of those research um, data, including the unpublished ones, but they were real studies that were submitted to the FDA for antidepressants and found overall that there's actually no clear evidence of any benefit from antidepressants, that you're simply, it doesn't differentiate substantially from the placebo effect, like giving a sugar pill. And I couldn't understand after we read this paper and everybody agreed that that was a valid conclusion that the, the next day, they expected us to continue to prescribe antidepressants. Wow. So I was like, we just learned, you know, about this. And then you're telling us not to act on it, to just keep it as knowledge and then do the opposite. <laughs> so wow. it, it just made me really concerned. And then later on, while I was still at Duke, the 
big announcement came that antidepressants could lead to suicidal behaviors. And the FDA issued a black box warning. That's their, their most severe warning before pulling something from the market. And same thing. So we looked at that. And what did the professors say? They told us, oh, it's, it's blown out of proportion. It's a misunderstanding. We know these drugs are safe. They're like, mm. but to protect our liability so we don't get sued just in case, because we know depressed patients commit suicide and it has nothing to do with the drugs. It's just they misunderstand it. But just to protect ourselves, what we're going to do is we're going to, every time we prescribe antidepressants for, you know, for a new patient, we're going to call them up a couple of days later and make sure they're not suicidal. Right. So instead of looking at and saying, hey, could these things be harmful? We're going to instead worry about protecting our own ass. Right. right. That's what's important. Now, let me tell you something about that from my experience, because at the time I was very skeptical that a drug could cause a specific behavior or a specific thought. Right. That you take a drug and then you start thinking about suicide. Like I couldn't understand how a drug could make you think something specific. But then several years later, when I was practicing with adolescents, I noticed that there were a bunch of girls, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, that came to the facility under my care that were thinking about suicide every day, and they were taking antidepressants. And as I tapered them off the antidepressant, the suicidal thoughts disappeared. And then I started asking them, I said, hey, when did you start thinking about suicide every day? And, and I was in many of the cases, it was basically right after they started taking antidepressants. They might have been thinking about it before, but not as frequently. Something changed about it. It became, you know, more every day. And, and then every time, so then I ended up with dozens of patients, teenagers, that after they came off the antidepressants, the suicidal thoughts went away. And then I looked in the literature and I found studies that show that suicide thoughts lead to suicidal behavior, which leads to actual suicide. So in other words, a portion of the thoughts translate into actually death of someone, right? But the FDA didn't report it that way because they wanted to make it seem less, less serious because they didn't want to pull it off the market. But this is a real thing. You know, I observed it with my own two eyes. So after I finished my general psychiatry training, during that time, I had learned about forensic psychiatry. And that was really, really interesting and attractive to me because, well, first of all, it was very unique and it's a very small number of people that do this um, in the world. But it gives you the chance to like look at information and data make an educated guess, really, because there's very limited certainty in psychiatry. Like, it's not like you can look at a brain biopsy and say, you know, this shows they were crazy when they killed their wife. So, so you have to make an argument, you have to back it up and you have to, you know, not have holes in it and such. And then you kind of get to like, you know, debate it or be interrogated about it and have to be you know, clever and sharp and pay attention and all that just appealed to me. And as you could see, it's a lot of what I've been doing the last couple of years, just not in a court of law <laughs> or to public opinion. It's very, very helpful. Uh, you know, um, as we'll get into later, I, I've known Tom, um, Dr. Cowan for a long time and then followed with other interviews. So when you started sharing your views on the virus, it wasn't news to me as a concept, but it was interesting to see somebody with your background, your, you know, credentials, basically saying the same kinds of things, because it's easy when one or two doctors are saying that to just blow these guys off as quacks. But, you know, you, you, know, you, you come from too rigorous of a background to really be easily pushed into that box. And, you know, because I have enough background in science and and research and all that, I could follow your steps. And I'm like, okay, this is 
very clear and this this has to be looked at and people need to see this so i, I don't know you know my text bill probably uh, went through the roof because i must have shared your videos with <laughs> hundreds of people you know there'd be like my whole text box would be full of me sharing your videos with and and a lot of famous people as well that have influence um including jp sears who i don't know if you know but he was a student of mine for about seven years and taught for my institute for five years. JP was my protege for many years. Wow, I really uh, didn't know that. Of course, I'm familiar with his uh, more recent work. Yeah, so he he began uh, he he dropped out of college and joined my program when he was 19, and I took him under my wing and turned him into an instructor, and then he came to the point where he wanted to go do comedy, and I just give him a big hug and said, "Follow your heart, buddy." And so thank God, because he's out there doing his job too. There's a saying I teach all of my students. The pain is seldom where the actual problem is. For example, I've seen many cases of rotator cuff problems that wouldn't heal even after surgery. But what most doctors and therapists overlook is that the right shoulder is under influence from the liver and the left shoulder the stomach. Once we apply the principles of detoxification, support digestion, and clear parasites, presto, shoulders start healing and working beautifully again. If you learn to see people holistically, like I teach my students in Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 1, you begin to see the true source of our illnesses and injuries. HLC-1 teaches you many essential approaches to health and well-being, such as how to assess what key body systems are under too much stress and how to restore balance, the importance of identifying a realistic dream goal or objective that inspires each individual to stick to their healing program and make the short and long-term changes that are necessary, my universally applicable 1-2-3-4 formula for assessing and correcting challenges, how to breathe optimally to enhance energy levels and mental clarity, how to use gentle movements to work in and enhance life force energy and support optimal immune function, how the function and health of the soil that food is grown in influences all systems of the body, including our mental emotional stability, and much more. HLC-1 is just a small part of what we teach our Czech Academy students, our education system for elite trainers and health professionals. Gavin Jennings and I designed the academy to take you from wherever you are right now, even if you have no fitness or health education, to being one of the best holistic health and performance professionals on this planet. And as a Czech Academy student, you'll be able to help a lot of people reach their health goals in ways you never imagined. There is, in my opinion, nothing more rewarding and meaningful in life than helping other people look, feel, and live better. We are now accepting applications into the Czech Academy, so whether you're wanting to change your career or add a truly effective new dimension to your current skill set, now is the time to apply. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy. Let's make the world a better place together. Uh, one of the thoughts that came to me while you were talking is that I've had countless people reach out to me with suicidal thoughts, often responding to my YouTube videos. And the, the standard approach that I give them is to get rid of all the processed junk foods they're eating and cut back on video games as much as possible. And so far, 100% of them that followed my recommendations and switched to organic food, usually within a week, no longer have suicidal thoughts. So I think there's a lot of additives in food, many of which are not being put on the labels that either are independently or in combination triggering off um, negative psychological effects in people, because I've seen this at least a hundred times now in the last 10 years. It's, um, and that, I bring that up because there's other things going on out there besides the uh, types of drugs you're speaking specifically about. I don't know if you're familiar with Leonard Sachs, MD, who speaks a lot about the issues with young men and women, but he goes quite deep into the dangers of the ADD drugs and talks about how they were, um, they put kids on them that had no negative symptoms and were completely normal and then compared them to other kids and basically showed that the drug was just 
it was doing the same thing to normal kids as it was to kids that apparently had ADD, which was just hot. He called them like brain steroids. It was just jacking them up like they were on speed. But he was, he showed that it, if it does this to normal kids, um, then you're really doing dealing with a, with an effect of the drug. You're not actually addressing the issue. So it was very interesting to hear his descriptions. Um, you know, Dr. Kaufman, there's many questions I'd like to talk about, and I will get to, and I appreciate your capacity for the big picture view on the COVID, I call it a pandemic because I don't think it's a pandemic, and related issues. Having spent more than 600 hours studying what's going on since the start of it, probably a thousand now, actually, as well as my wife, Angie, uh, I have two wives, just so you're not confused. Um, we've all studied it intensively. Um, you know, I'm very aware of the psyops aspect of it and the divide and conquer and confuse and all that. I studied Leonard Horowitz's book and YouTube videos, DNA Pirates of the Sacred Spile, and he shows that Carnegie and Rockefeller foundations have been looking at ways to manipulate people and, and engineered technologies for DNA for the better part of a hundred years. Um, most people that research these issues are aware of governments confiscating effective treatments for cancer and other diseases, free energy technologies, and more. And I have multiple books in my library going all the way back to the 1960s exposing corruption in the FDA. Um, we've got a, clearly got some serious problems with people like Gates and other oligarchs uh, taking over the World Health Organization, governments infecting the legal system, eroding constitutional rights, and much more. Uh, we've got Naomi Klein's book and documentary, The Shock Doctrine, which really lays the picture on the table quite nicely. There's a lot of evidence of eugenics programs being run disguised as vaccination programs. And Bill Gates' father is well known for implementing the Rockefeller medical mafia and his participation in the eugenics movement. So all that is my way of saying there's a lot going on right now and a lot of shadows are coming into the light. A lot of people are very, very confused. I would love to hear your take on the big picture view. What do you ultimately think is going on? Because there is a lot of moving parts, a lot of disagreement, a lot of confusion, a lot of infighting, but I see a lot of arrows pointing into a common theme behind the scenes. Um, I'm just really curious. I mean, I'm sure with your brain, you're looking at all these factors yourself. What, what do you think's really going on here? Well, you know, I mean, of course, there's uh, different ways you could look at this. You can look at it exoterically and esoterically. And I, I think you're looking for the latter. So I'll just kind of go down to the deepest level that Please. I'm aware of. And, you know, let me also just say that this information, I, I don't have as strong of uh, you know certainty about all of the factual details compared to uh, what I would talk about with medical science. Well, but I trust your intuition. <laughs> there's there's a not a lot of compelling evidence. I mean, it, this isn't also just intuition; it's a combination of things. But essentially, you know, my thoughts are is that there are a group of you know beings. I don't know their true nature, you know, if they're human, if they're Nephilim, if they are some other life form. But let's just, you know, assume that they're human for the purpose of this discussion, because I don't have any direct knowledge that anyone's not human. But that, that these um, elite group, we could call them empire, that they've been in existence at least since ancient Egypt, probably before. Yes. And um, they have uh, essentially created and working towards a common goal over the centuries, a network of other organizations. And these change over time, right? They come and go like the Knights of Templar. And mm -hmm. some of them persist over our time and are very much up in the hierarchy, like the Jesuits, for example. And that um, the, all of the folks directly involved in this, that there's like an inner circle who are really the decision makers. And then they have this special kind of structure and different people have described it using different analogies like David Icke, uh, Spiderweb, G. Edward Griffin has a slightly different uh, way of, of uh, describing it. But essentially, 
that this small group is really the only ones who know everything that's going on. And then there are circles around them that are have less knowledge, but think that they have all the knowledge. And then, you know, as the levels get further out from the central power structure, that there's compartmentalization. So many of the people who actually carry out the tasks of this empire are have no knowledge of what they're really doing. And, and may, many of them actually think that they're doing good for the world, for their uh, brothers and sisters throughout the earth. But this plan, you know, has really seemed to materialize in earnest over the last century toward a sort of global technocracy. And what I mean by technocracy, we'll go back to what the original technocratic writings actually used to define themselves as essentially a system of social engineering to manage society. And this would be done by the technocrats who are the, you know, the scientist and engineer class, um, essentially, rather than, you know, they're the political leadership rather than politicians or, or lawyers or uh, statesmen. And that they could not implement this plan, you know, at the 20th century or after World War II or World War I as they probably wanted to because they did not have the pro appropriate technological infrastructure for the social engineering, which is really the telecommunications industry. So we're talking about the internet and, and mobile communications because now, right, we have the ability to track and trace everyone practically they're trying feverishly to make sure everyone has a cell phone and everyone has broadband and the if once some additional technology is implemented then it could control your access to finances transportation basically every sector of society so that is kind of the requisite and that's related to the timing that's going on right now but this plan involves every single sector of our lives, right? So it involves our recreation, it involves our religion, which they really want to wipe, wipe out completely. It involves transportation, it involves energy, it involves finance and the banking system, the way that we pay for goods and earn money. Um, that is a, a central part of the way to use technology to get control um, and to you know, essentially enslave humanity into a working, subservient uh, working class who follows whatever rules the empire sets forth. And through these past few years of the pandemic, and I, I prefer that term as well, because clearly it was planned and it has nothing to do with an illness. Um, but it is a way to essentially use the kind of Hegelian dialectic of um, problem reaction solution through the health system, because people are very fearful about existential issues about dying. And, you know, they used terrorism uh, for a while, and now they're, you know, kind of switching to pandemics or, uh, right, which is a, a new scary fake disease. And that's a way to essentially get people to willingly cooperate with integrating this system. So like, because genetic misogynation or transhumanism is part of this, that actually the goal is to change men and women from their current um, phenotype and genotype to some new organism, hybrid with machine or engineered or perhaps even owned by a private entity as, as intellectual property. And that's the reason why the, the this brand new, you know, quote unquote vaccine technology, which really has nothing to do with that, is a, a way of genetically altering the recipient. And we don't know what else it does. So we don't really know exactly how it does that because, you know, DNA itself may not even be present in natural biological systems. <laughs> and this may just be a, a technology used to hack organisms. And it may not be the way that we normally actually do this, but it clearly is, has that intention. And they've rolled it out in many industries, right? You can raise genetically modified uh, cattle and other animals for food. You can, of course, uh, they have a sort of a monopoly on the genetically modified seeds for certain crops like corn, soy, and wheat. So, you know, you can see this, this is kind of my overall understanding of, of what 
has been going on and is going on now. And, and it really is completely pervasive and cross-sectional to every single part of our existence. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very good overview. I appreciate that. And you're just reaffirming, you know, what I've known to be true and why I wanted to interview that your your mind goes far outside the confines of the AMA's, you know, little box. Uh, and thank God for that. You made me think of something which I wrote down as you were talking, and that is I've seen, as many people have now, many interviews with uh, Peter McCullough and his congressional hearings and all that. But I saw interviews earlier on where he straight out admitted this is not a vaccine. It's a tracking device. And without going into a long discussion of that, but in my research, by the way, I used to wear pair of weapon systems and Cobra helicopters in the military. So I spent a year in electronics school and worked with some of the most advanced military technology at the time. And I have a very comprehensive library and I've got books going all the way back and discussing uh, things like radionics and the uh, use of radionics for a variety of things. But one of the books that I have documents as early as I believe late thirties, early forties, a couple of guys, I can't remember why they got into this technology, but I think it was because uh, chemicals for controlling farming pests were so expensive, but they were using radionic technology. And what they did was they developed an amplifier, like a, like a, a, a radio amplifier. And they took the farming chemicals known to kill certain plant pests, so like a potato worm for, for the potato plant, and they would put a little bit of the chemical into the broadcast, and they would broadcast this stuff in a field, and there was really nothing but the electronic signal, and they had a 98% kill rate, which was better than any chemical out there, and they would do you know, thousands of acres for farmers for a fraction of the price that it would cost them to buy the chemicals. And that was extremely successful. But the next thing you know, DuPont chemicals started getting reports from their salesmen that we can't sell chemicals because somebody's going around with some new technology. And they started snooping in and, and, and they found out, you know, the basics of how it was working. Well, the next thing you know, government agencies showed up and confiscated the technology. And they said, you know, this is completely safe. There's, it's far better than the chemicals. Why are you taking it? And the government officials that took it said, because if you can kill bugs with it, it could also be used to kill human beings. Now, this was in the late 30s or early 40s. This was a long time ago. So having studied that and many, many other books by very smart people from Marcel Vogel to many others, and knowing what you can do with this type of technology, it doesn't surprise me at all that they've got a hold of many, many such technologies and can be using the 5G system to manipulate people's DNA and even their thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Uh, probably 20 years ago, I was doing research on something, and I just had the curiosity if the military had any weapons, beam weapons, or what, using frequencies to control people's thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and I found a patent, and I have three patents myself. I'm an inventor, so I know how to do that kind of research. I found a, a weapon they had developed in the military all the way back in the late 80s that they could point at a crowd, and they could either make people angry, they could make them want to buy things, they could manipulate them, and it looked like a, a megaphone, but a bigger megaphone. And the technology was right there. I've also studied information fields, and it's pretty amazing when you start studying information fields, what can be done with information fields. So the point I'm driving at is I was watching Peter McCullough actually start telling the truth from what I perceived it to be with my knowledge of electronic technology, what can be done, what's been done in the past. But then all of a sudden he stopped talking about it. And then he was on Joe Rogan's show and he kept referencing all these studies. But I'm like, he's referencing studies that are actually done by universities that are being funded by the very people that are involved in all this stuff. So I'm curious 
what your thoughts are on some of these other aspects, the tracking device element of it, the manipulation of people's internal biochemistry, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And the other thing that, that I heard recently that I thought was really realistic is, you know, you've, you're seeing now these coroners pulling all this stuff out of people. And one of them recently pulled a very long wire that had self-assembled. Interestingly, when he looked up close with a microscope, it had a pattern on it like snakeskin, which was very interesting. But he proposed, and I would agree, that this makes a very good antenna system. And one of the arguments put forward by another expert whose name I don't remember right now because I see so many of these videos was that because of the way 5G works, they need to turn people antennas because that way this, they can use them like broadcasting stations. So the signal can be conducted between people, just like you conduct it through 5G antennas that have to be closely placed together, unlike the 4G systems. So I, that was the first time I'd thought of it th from that perspective. Previously, I only thought of it as they're just using the satellites and other technologies to, to get into people. And then there's the other thing that I saw. One guy took four people that had been vaccinated and four unvaccinated people way up to the top of a mountain, well out of cell phone range. And then he said to the people that were unvaccinated, turn your cell phone on, see if you can get a signal. No signal. He couldn't get a signal. And then he took, he said, now I want you to take your cell phones right next to the people that have been vaccinated. And every one of them could get an IP address that was live while they were on top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. And I've personally taken my phone next to people that have been vaccinated and you get an IP address with a long serial number on it. So I'm curious as to what your thoughts are with regard to the vaccination being a tracking device and what your thoughts are on their ability to activate or deactivate genes or trigger diseases in people and then claim they died of natural causes. Well, I, I think I'd rather talk about just, you know, what technology is known to actually exist. Sure. Rather than speculate about what may have happened with these injections, because the truth is, is that no one really knows. And you know, even if one person finds a wire in an autopsy, you know, they use wires in medical practice. They use it to thread catheters. Uh, they use it for cardiac procedures. So, you know, it's it's not conclusive, um, you know, in, until it's conclusive. So I, I encourage people to keep, you know, doing and reporting these kind of anecdotal information or looking under the microscope. But if you want to claim that something is something, it's important to use recognized standards um, that would be, you know, used in in a serious uh, situation, like in manufacturing. Like if you, you know, if you're going to manufacture something and use a raw material, for example, if you're going to make a circuitry that involves graphene, when you either make or buy the graphene, you have to certify that it that it really is graphene, and there's a standard chemical way to do that, that it gives some kind of thing that no, nothing else will test positive for. And then that tells you that this really is that material. And I just haven't seen that level of scientific analysis put forth, you know, in this arena. And I hope that people will do more rigorous experiments because, you know, one example of this confusion is that there are many microscopists that were showing uh, images from <clears throat> the vaccine vials that look like circuitry. But then another more experienced microscopist showed images that looked virtually identical and they were salt crystals. Mm. So you can easily misinterpret things visually without specific, you know, expert knowledge of what you're looking at. And if you're look, used to looking at blood cells, then you don't necessarily know what technology or other things look like under the microscope. So, but they do actually have a lot of the technology that you talked about, and you can, there are a number of ways you can investigate this. Um, so, for example, with respect to nanotechnology, especially for, you know, um, machine brain interfaces and anything to do with manipulating behavior, I've done a pretty exhaustive literature search and presented that actually in one of my COVID myths series. And you know, I found quite interesting things that even as of, uh, I think, 2016 at the University of Virginia, 
they were able to use a technology um, with magnets. I think they call it magnetofection, where they have a genetic modifying uh, you know, piece of DNA or RNA. And it's coupled to this uh, machine that can turn it on when it's in a magnetic field. And so, and this is something, by the way, that it can work in the brain, but it doesn't have to be injected or surgically implanted into the brain. It can be put in through a regular injection and, and then it finds its way to the brain. And so they had zebrafish that they injected these nano machines into. And then remotely, they were able to expose them to a magnetic field and alter their behavior mm -hmm. in, in real time. So this is something, so this type of a nanotech could easily be snuck into any kind of injection under the radar. And then if the recipient was exposed to that magnetic field, then it could exert that behavioral change you're talking about. Could it make them want to shop or could it make them have an emotional expression like anger? So at least in the combination of that particle, we have that. Now, I did see some another interesting interview, but this is a little bit less accurate than that scientific study. Um, this was a contractor at a big security firm, you know, like Blackwater, some, some outfit like that, working for a government contract for the NSA uh, type agency. And he was talking about how they lure uh, single adults who are in a vulnerable state, like they lost their job, they have no family, they're about to like have their utilities turned off or be evicted, and they offer them a job. And this, this was based out of Seattle, Washington. And then they come to Seattle, and of course, the job offer is fake, and it doesn't work out, and then they end up at the homeless shelter. And it was at the homeless shelter where they installed some kind of technology that a remote technology using some kind of radio frequency to try and, you know, manipulate their thoughts and behavior uh, in a sort of an experimental fashion. So, and I, I thought that it seemed to me like this was honest and it, and it seems compatible with other applications of this technology. So there's like lectures from West Point that you can see where they talk about this technology. And then you have examples where, you know, 5G frequency ranges, you know, millimeter waves have been used actually for crowd control, even in the, in the, the theater of war, right? And those things is a similar point and shoot device, right? And it causes an intense burning sen sensation of the skin that makes people flee the proximity to it, right? So you can easily disperse a crowd, even a, you know, a crowd that's armed and, and uh, they're the enemy, you could make them go out of range and then you could attack them with a longer range weapon. So it's, you know, a very potent type of technology. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure how familiar you are with minerals and trace minerals, but minerals are important to our body for many, many functions and minerals and trace minerals also help regulate our hormonal system. And one of the products that I've been using for many years is Shilaje Minerals. But when I got a hold of Chervine's Shilaje from Symbiotica, it was a total notch above anything I've ever tried. So I've got Chervine here to tell us what's special about his Shilaje and how to use it. You know, Shilajit is, uh, you can pronounce it any way you want. I like Shilajit. It makes me want to dance a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the actual product makes me want to dance. Good. I take it on the rise. You know, it's at the center point of Ayurveda. It's, you know, a collection of fulvic minerals, soil, decomposition of plant material. So you're getting all the minerals and it, you're getting it the way Mother Earth provided it and the right. way we can absorb it. And so the way I look at that, it's instant energy and it reduces acidosis across the body. So if you want to reduce and chelate acids out of the body, Shilajit is pretty much the answer and the solution to that. And, you know, it's probably our best seller right now. Everybody's, you know, doing rituals with it on the rise and they're using it throughout the day. It makes for a really good, you know, tonic. It's delicious. Once your body starts getting acclimated to it, the flavor starts to kick in. And, you know, if you're a coffee drinker, if you're a matcha drinker, if you're a tea drinker, this is a really good balancer to keep your body nourished of what you need because most people drinking coffee, yes. they're pouring acids and already in it, on, onto an already acidic body. This is a a good way to balance that out through the minerals. And if you're not eating certified organic food from good soils, you're eating mineral deficient food. And the minerals in Shilajay are very important for our skin, our nails, and our hair, which a lot of people have problems with. So 
I think this is a great product across the board for anybody. And our jing, right? So we are mineral deficient. Yeah. Our foods have been dilapidated, right? It's yes. like Franken foods, right? Shilajit is mineralizing you to the blood, to yeah. the bone. And if you're a man, you're really going to feel it. Let me tell you. Yeah, well, good. I'm sure the women will <laughs> like that. So um, get your jing yes. with your shilajit. And jing, you know, that means your, your juice, your life force, boys. And uh, the nice thing about Shili J is it does not take much at all. No. Uh, a serving is tiny. It's very potent stuff. So it's not like you have to use a lot. It'll last you for quite a while. So go to Symbiotica, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And on checkout, to get your 15% discount, use the code CHECK15, all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15. And remember, check out all their other products because your discount works right across the board. Enjoy. You know, I'm going <clears> to <throat> ask you a question just because I think it's something I want to ask you specifically. What do you think it is about human beings that has oriented us towards so much death, destruction, and war versus seeking to put that much energy into cooperation, harmony? And realizing that we all are part of one living system. I mean, we all need healthy soil. We all need clean water. And, you know, if you look at, we all enjoy music from around the world, food from around the world. I mean, I watch all this racist stuff going on and I see, I see so many behaviors in people that are and the military industrial complex is a monster that's completely out of control. And it just seems like hell bent on finding more and more ways to destroy people. And I've seen research showing that right now, worldwide, we have enough nuclear power to completely annihilate the planet 179 times over. Uh, you, you know, what, what, what is it you, do you think that's driving this? orientation toward separation, division, and what we don't want and ultimately is leading us to the kinds of situation that we have now versus what really, at its core, religion was a system for helping people have morals, ethics, virtues, and to support the development of a society and to orient people toward source instead of um, illusory sources. I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that. Well, you know, this is, I want to say that, that I believe that this change that you're talking about has been brought about intentionally, um, you know, by the system of empire, which I discussed earlier. But essentially, the explanation is that men and women have lost their connection with nature. Mm -hmm. They've lost their connection with God. They've lost their connection with truth. Yeah. They've lost their connection with each other. And, you know, I believe, as I said, that this has been purposeful through various systems of propaganda and indoctrination, such as the compulsory schooling system um, and also the crumbling of the religious institutions, which really also was in, in this intentional drive towards atheism, uh, the introduction of the new age the, you know, philosophy of materialism and reductionism um, and the covering up of even scientific experiments that bring us outside the material world and suppression of those and the focus of all research and technology and worldviews being, you know, towards strict materialism. And of course, you know, overall, the cultural philosophy that we're really talking about is, uh, is nihilism and decadence. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's when you have no meaning in your life because you have no connection to the creator and you have no connection to your brother and sister that you feel selfish, right? Our culture has created uh, sort of infantilized, very selfish individuals that, you know, we have to sort of do our penance to live, which is the nine to five job. And then every moment of our spare time is you know, spent in self-indulgence, uh, escape, um, and pleasure seeking, 
right? That's the, the decadent part because there's no meaning. Right. There's no higher objective. There's no will to, you know, do God's work, to help be part of a community, to, you know, help your neighbor, to mm -hmm. like the, just the joy of raising your family. Like we don't even raise our own children anymore. We send them, you know, we, many more hours than we're with them. We send them to be raised by strangers in a brick building, you know, essentially the government. We said we let the government raise our children. Or and video so all games. of these things, factors combined together, and all of that lost connection, you know, of course, that leaves a, you know, um, a fend for yourself, dog eat dog, competitive, mind, selfish thing because as soon as you die right it's all over there's nothing else so you have to get as much out of this life as possible and even at the expense of others and that's the cultural philosophy essentially that's become the modern western experience right or it's going mm -hmm. getting closer and closer to that because many of these things are actually encouraged in the popular culture they're glorified in the media in the music in in the arts Right. But, you know, in day to day interactions of people, most people still are not, you know, they're not racist. They're not violent. They're not bitter. They're, people mostly are nice and friendly and courteous and understanding and want to do the right thing. That's our impulse. And it's really strong. It's difficult to quiet that in everyone and suppress yeah. it into, you know, complete depravity. But mm -hmm. for a small number of, you know, people with psychopathic tendencies or willing to go to that dark side, it, it is definitely, you know, a time that, that they are kind of, you know, running rampant a bit. And, uh, you know, I think they want more of that chaos to help bring in the reason to control everyone. I'm curious if you think that we're, we're, I don't know if you know, but we're in a th what's considered now the third wave of the psychedelic revival. And we saw how when people got really pissed off and irritated about Vietnam, there was the psychedelic reaction to that. Um, I read a study uh, in my research on psychedelics. I, I use plant medicines for healing ceremonies and have a lot of experience with them for many years and was trained by a doctor on how to use them. But um, I read a research paper back from when shortly after um, Albert Hoffman first developed LSD-25, that one of the things that he did was he sent it to the United States military, he sent it to the Pentagon, I believe, and they wanted, he, he thought it might be useful as a truth, uh, truth serum. And they tested it on a team of green berets. And the interesting effect that as every, every one of the green berets after the drug war off wanted to get out of the military because they didn't want to kill people anymore because it all had deep spiritual experiences. I'm just curious if you think maybe Mother Nature is bringing us this third wave of psychedelics to help reconnect people to a sense of something greater to their hearts and to the realization that nature is not just a bunch of matter, that it's a living, breathing being. And, and then, of course, the source intelligence behind it. You know, I tell people all the time, matter cannot organize itself. So people that are caught in the materialist mindset overlook the fact that you can stand next to a pile of rocks for a trillion years and a watch isn't going to jump out of there. Something has to organize matter. So they're you know, if you look at the matter in the universe and the fact that we have life here and probably life of many different types in other regions of the universe, there's an obviously an organizing intelligence. And I think that plant medicines certainly help many people become aware of what you might call spirit, God, or an organizing intelligence. So my question is, do you think that maybe this resurgence of psychedelics is to help us reconnect with what's been lost through all this industrialization. Well, you know, I do think that there is uh, a lot more opportunity to reconnect um, during the current epoch because of the nature of what we are facing, right? The obviousness, I mean, empire has completely exposed itself. We have massive polarization. So the opportunity is here. But I I want to be a little bit cautious about this because, you know, one thing is I, I certainly don't deny 
the role of these psychedelic plant compounds, right? Like in ayahuasca and mescaline and many others that have been used, you know, for probably millennia in various types of ceremonies and rituals that have true, um, you know, significance in terms of personal spiritual development, in terms of health and healing, uh, morality, and all of these issues, right? And uh, so that, you know, of course, has always been important and continues to be. When LSD was, you know, used and popularized in the 60s, that, that was, you know, intentional and for experimental purposes, largely. For example, you know, we know the CIA had programs where they were, you know, giving this to um, people and trying to brainwash them and, you know, yeah. traumatize them. MK right? Ultra. And and MK like Ultra. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now a lot of that has been disclosed through uh, freedom of information. And then there are some survivors that have told their stories. And, you know, the whole 60s, um, hippie movement and music really was all to subvert the youth because as a, you know, in response to that violence and that war, there was a real rebellious reaction from the youth that they really wanted to, you know, say to the government, we don't want you doing this stuff. And it was going to be serious. But by infusing the drugs and the music, it essentially turned that revolutionary spirit into, you know, something totally different that was mm -hmm. subdued and never would, you know, rise to the level that it would actually change society. And I think largely the psychedelic wave of that was really for that purpose. Now, of course, there were people who were even perhaps victims of that who didn't have that outcome, who it may have been life changing for them. It may have been a spiritual awakening experience. So, you know, there's nothing is ever all good or all bad. But in the current wave, when I see that there, you know, that there are a lot of people who are sort of, you know, there, there are people who are really serious, that they're trying to develop themselves spiritually, that they're really trying to seek the truth, that they are trying to improve their own selves, and that they may have a need to work something out. In my path, I've had this and I've called on uh, this medicine for that specific purpose and it, and it did help me immensely. But what I've seen at, you know, larger gatherings and conferences and in, you know, in groups of people talking is that there are many people who are not really using it appropriately, that it's more of an escape or something to just do over and over again, like that is the spiritual practice. Yes, I'm, I'm totally hip to that. I have people come to me from all over the world that have been very messed up by the inappropriate use of these medicines. And it's only because I've done so much of my own uh, research, not only in my own body, but in, in the literature right. um, that I'm able to. And plus, uh, having studied shamanism for many years, and I'm married to a highly trained shaman, um, that I'm able to help these people. But it, it, it almost every single case, it's from too big a dose, too frequent of a use, and not using it spiritually. And almost always, it's right. some form of escapism or attempt to medicate something that ultimately needs to be handled at a conscious level, not pushed down into a state of drug-induced unconsciousness. Right. So it's it's really, I mean, you know, it's a fantastic service that you're able to help parse out with someone those things because, you know, it, it really, there is a, a tremendous potential of benefit, uh, you know, uh, in this approach. So, yeah. so it is important. But, it, you know, what you're talking about leads me to kind of a, a principle that I try to impart upon anyone that I work with in terms of a consultation or if I'm educating about any health aspects, which is that there are like procedures that you can do to facilitate your healing process. But those are like, you know, you do something for the purpose of healing. It's a time limited thing that you're doing. You know, I mean, even in the mainstream system, they have this, right? You go get surgery, you go get a round of chemotherapy. But 
of course, in you know, with real natural healing, it it involves um, things that you do with your day to day life and your behavior because that's what caused the the disease or illness state or the lack of health in the first place, right? So, the key thing is not that you do an ayahuasca ceremony, or the key thing is not that you do a water fast or that you do uh, you know some Doctor X's protocol. It's what you do the day after. after. Yeah. Right? Because that's going to determine whether whatever, however that thing benefited, is it going to continue to benefit you every day? Or is that benefit going to go away with your memory of the event? So Mm -hmm. it's this, you know, this is critically true with um, a plant ceremony as well, that, you know, whatever spiritual question you're seeking to answer or um, issue that you want to resolve or get get knowledge and insight about, you have to then, once you achieve that, you have to then wake up the next day and say, how am I going to use that now to change my life and make it better or make myself better, right? And it's up to me only to do that. And if And I always know if that aspect is not part of the planning, then it's not a serious endeavor. You know, for yes. any of these, any of these types of things, the same thing. If you were going to go to a meditation or treat, it would be the exact same thing. It is. I tell people, look, the medicines, the plant medicines, and meditation won't do the work of healing for you. They're like doors or windows. They take you and show you, you know, where you're hung up with jealousy, revenge, regret, resent, where you're playing the victim, where you have healing to do. But they aren't going to do the healing for you. You have to take this experience of, uh, and the awareness cultivated by the ceremony. And then that's where, you know, it requires somebody to guide you. Or as a therapist, I, I hold people accountable. I say, okay, look, you know, we're going to go look and see, you know, maybe what's attached to why you got cancer, but that's going to bring you into a level, bring you to a level of awareness that's going to require some real honest soul searching behavior change. And it might mean disconnecting from relationships that are not good for you. It might mean changing your career. It could mean, you know, healing and forgiving people that you're holding resent toward. And I built a system many years ago to give people a, a set of values to work with. I call it Dr. Happiness, which is What am I willing to do to create happiness for myself? And Dr. Happiness is the chief physician who's responsible for categorizing your values on what are my values around movement? What are my values around diet? And what are my values around Dr. Quiet, rest and and introspection, looking into myself? And so whenever I'm working with people, regardless of what their issue is, I'm always looking at them through the eyes of those four doctors. And inevitably, they have challenges in all four areas. Some don't, but most do. And I show people, look, you cannot reduce holism or well-being below those four doctors. You can be perfectly healthy in three, but if you're not sleeping, you're going to end up in trouble. If you're a great athlete, you eat well and you sleep well, but you don't have any idea what's happy making for you, you'll be a fit, miserable person. Um, so the point I that I, yes, yeah, I, and we even have what I call, I coined the term fit, sick, fit, sick, fit, sick people about 20 years ago because I worked with so many professional athletes in my career. But the, the point being is I think this also goes right back to the situation we're in worldwide. People have lost connection with what is happy making and taking responsibility for doing that for them in healthy ways. What is the amount of movement I need for baseline health? And then what's the level of movement, fitness, and skill that I need for my specific endeavor, be it climbing a mountain, playing hockey, or being fit enough to play with your grandkids? What is real food where, you know, real food comes from real soil and what's right for me, not what some diet book says. And how much rest do I need to be a healthy person? And am I taking time to look into myself and get to know myself and have a real relationship with myself? And I think, you know, one of the arguments I've had with many people is if Trump would have spent $2 trillion to educate people in four doctors, we could have transformed the world and done something positive instead of playing 
stupid games with money and people think they were getting bailed out. But I'm like, wait till you see the cost of that loan. Hi, everybody. I imagine some of you are finding that your mind is not as sharp as it was or that you can't seem to remember things as well, such as the last page you read in the book or the key points from a meeting you just attended recently. Do you feel that your brain is taking longer to come online or that your thinking gets muddled or fuzzy when you've got a lot to get done? If so, Organifi Pure may be just the magic you need. A key ingredient in Organifi Pure, called Neurofactor, showed a significant impact on brain-derived neurotropic factor, which has been widely reported to play a critical role in neuronal development, maintenance, repair, and protection against neurodegeneration. The certified organic combination of herbs in Organifi Pure not only enhances mental clarity and promotes brain-derived neurotropic factor to stimulate the development of new neural pathways, It aids in enhanced digestion, which is important because many cognitive problems are symptoms of poor digestion. To get your Organifi Pure, go to organifi.com forward slash check 20. That's organifi.com forward slash check 20. Get 20% off with your promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's capitals, check 20. Enjoy Organifi Pure. The, the kind of the real meat and potatoes uh, I wanted to get to you with is this issue of what a virus is. And as I mentioned, I've shared patients with Tom Cowan and, and I know his perspectives on that. He's probably the first person I met that challenged the concept of the virus. Then I listened to an excellent podcast interview with Don Lester and David Parker, and they, like you, demolished the concept of the virus step by step. And I bought their book, um, What Really Makes You Ill, Why Everything You Thought You Knew About Disease is Wrong, which is, are you familiar with the book? Yeah, I I know Don and David. I've uh, I've read a good chunk of the book. You know, it's uh, heroic to read every page, but it's- It is uh, very big, yes. It's extremely uh, detailed and comprehensive. Right. And so I read their section on viruses specifically because- hearing you talk, hearing Tom Cowan, hearing them, and having my own suspicions. So I read it uh, because I I wanted to see what exactly they say beyond what they said in the podcast. And it really echoed a lot of what you already say. I've listened to a lot of the podcast with you. And I think it was very, you know, I found it very interesting that Bill Gates actually had a coronavirus, a patent on coronavirus 19 that he was awarded three months before the pandemic came out. Well, let me uh, just clarify. You can't patent something from nature, right? They say that coronavirus is from nature. So he had a patent on some proprietary genetic sequence or some kind of technology. That's what it right? was labeled as, though. It was called Corona-19. I saw the patent myself. Mm-hmm. But he can't patent uh, you know, a natural virus. So it would have had to be a vaccine Modified. based on it, a genetic yeah. sequence right? Or some genetically modified version of it. Yeah, I totally agree. The point is, is that he had that patent miraculously three months before the pandemic started. I thought that was just a little bit too much of a coincidence. And he's got a patent on the tracking devices for monitoring people's finances and all that stuff. I'm like, okay, there's another red flag. Uh, If I was analyzing someone with orthopedic issues, I would say they already have two very serious (laughs) issues going on. And then the other thing is we have very reputable people like Judy Mikovits, Joe McCullough, Peter McCullough, Mike Yaden, uh, Gert Vanderbosch, Robert Malone, and many others speaking of viruses as facts. And then we have investigations into Fauci's gain of function research. So, you know, this... I, I, like I said, I looked into this, I've listened to you, I've listened to Tom Cowan, and my, my kind of my conundrum is how can we have credible people like Judy Mikovits and some of the ones I've just mentioned, and, and then how can we have Fauci doing gain of function research on virus if there isn't viruses? So is, is, is it something else that they're working on that we're just calling viruses? Is it just a, another infectious organism? Um, I'd love it if you can, break this down for us in stepwise logical fashion, because it's very tricky when you've got somebody with your credibility and even Tom Cowan and uh, the people that I mentioned, 
going against what other credible or people are saying and it leaves everybody kind of confused which i think makes the whole thing even worse so i i, I would just love it if you can do what you do so well and 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 say how is it that someone like judy mikovits could be confused about what a virus is well there's a lot um to unpack there and let me let me just dispose of the gain of function issue first because nobody knows what gain of function is do you, I mean, can you tell me what it is? How do you know about it? You only know about it, right, from rumors that there's some secret research going on and it has something supposedly to do with viruses, right? But there's no published papers. There's no lab notebooks to review, right? There's, we, have no, we have no knowledge. Here's, here's what I do have. I was in the 82nd Airborne Division. Mm -hmm. I know what the military gets up to. I know how ruthless they are. I actually know soldiers that went to Fort Detrick and were involved in weaponizing every damn thing they could get a hold of. So when I hear about gain of function research, for me, with what I know about the military industrial complex, that whatever label they're putting on it, they're always up to evil shit. That's, that's where I step on. That's where I, you know, that's, that's the bus I know. So Yes, I agree yeah. with what you're saying, but I also know well, how crooked these people are. I I'm sure they are up to evil stuff, but that, you know, we don't know any detail about it. So if we talk about it, then we're really just spewing the same kind of misinformation that's coming from the mainstream. Well, all that's we why I'm asking that, you this question. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all I can say is it's top secret and there's no inflammation disclosed. So how can I say what it is? But I, I can tell you about other research that has been, you know, published and, and disclosed um, where, for example, look at the technology that's in the vaccines. Yes. Essentially, what they made is a synthetic version of the description of a virus. Right. Right. Because it has a shell, right, which in this case is made of, uh, of, of a... Um, liposomal uh, material with, uh, with polyethylene glycol. Um, and then inside is genetic material, mm -hmm. right? That's pretty much what they say a virus is. So if they can make essentially synthetic, you know, pseudoviruses, and by the way, they do these for other experiments as well, then they could simply be making those and trying to make them uh, weaponized in some way. But the, the thing about that is, is that that's not how things happen in nature. Like they've tried, um, you know, extensively to show that um, contagion occurs through body fluids, which would, you know, uh, uh, supposedly contain these particles that are the agents of disease. But in study after study, try as they might, they could not transfer an illness like the Spanish flu or a cold from one or, or chicken pox from one individual organism to another through exchange of any kind of fluids or tissues of the disease. So whatever they're doing, it's probably, it's not going to be based on that. That's something that doesn't exist in nature unless they come up with some kind of new technology, right? Like there was some information about a technology where they had um, robot mosquitoes that could carry a small liquid payload and actually inject it into animals and, and humans, right? So that could be something that comes from some kind of military research. But the truth is, we have no idea what they're doing. But with respect to the other, you know, scientists and doctors that, um, that have not uh, agreed with the opinion that viruses actually don't exist, I think you have to break it down a little bit into a couple of different groups. So, you know, let's just briefly talk about Judy Mikovits, and I would encourage people to look. You can find it that there was one time when we got to sort of debate this issue on a panel discussion. And what, what she essentially said is that when it comes to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that is, you know, allegedly associated with COVID, that that virus doesn't exist. No. Um, and they haven't isolated it. But when it comes to her work with HIV, which, by the way, has never been published, she, she's not authored on any HIV paper that I could find in the literature, 
she says, well, in that case, it's different because that's a retrovirus and they don't have to be separated from the cell and by themselves to say they're real. Now, I don't know how she could apply one standard to one virus and a different standard to a different virus, but that's all I need to say that I can't trust her opinion because she is applying different rules for the same phenomena in a different context. And that that's just like Fauci saying one day masks aren't necessary and the next day saying wear two masks. Mm-hmm. Anyone that contradicts themselves over time or across different subject it, is not really trustworthy. Now, I really like Judy Mikovits, and I, I don't know why she won't have this discussion with me and, and actually get to a point of, of reasoning, but that that's where, you know, that's where we left it. And I'm always open to talking with her. And I really do like her. And I think she's doing a lot of good, you know, for the truth movement. Yes. There, there are many doctors, famous doctors in the, in the public spotlight. Um, and, and, and associated people like, um, you know, people who are, um, bloggers, journalists, maybe even attorneys, um, activists, who, um, you know, speak all the time as if viruses are real. And many of those people that, you know, I have had some interactions with or some of my other colleagues in this area, uh, like Dr. Cowan or Sam and Mark Bailey, uh, Christine Massey, et cetera, have tried many times to reach out and have discussions with these individuals. But, but here's, now, I don't know what their reason is for this, like, because you'd have to ask them. I can't, you know, get into no, someone else's head, right? No, you can't, you but, can't be their head. But, but here's what I know. So that if, if they talk directly about my work or Dr. Cowan's work, they, they use a lot of logic fallacy and ad hominem. So they say things like, Dr. Kaufman's not a virologist, or uh, Dr. Kaufman's not a doctor, or he's a jerk, or he's doing it well, for the money. And they, no, they, they say all kinds of stuff like that. It's okay. That's disgusting. Um, but that's not an actual scientific discussion, right? No, it's not and, even an effective debate. And then also, if you, say, if you say something like, well, okay, if viruses don't exist, what causes rabies? That also, that's a logic fallacy um, because whatever causes rabies has nothing to do with whether there's a virus or not. Like, obviously, if there's no virus, a virus can't cause rabies, but there's also no proof that there's a rabies virus either, but that's like circular logic, right? It's like a yeah. uh, kind of thing, or it's uh, affirming the consequent uh, because, well, of course there are viruses because they cause rabies. And then look, here's a animal with rabies. Therefore, there's a virus. That, that's a logic fallacy. It's not real reasoning. You can't get to a point that way. It's so, a self-reinforcing belief is what it is. Yes, Exactly. And so since this is the main thrust of what the other people say, right, that's not serious. So I don't know why that is. I don't know why they would say things like that, that were not really part of the discussion. But when I've talked with these people, here's what I know. They don't actually know what I'm saying. They didn't actually read the papers that allegedly discovered the virus, and they didn't certainly read anything I wrote or look at any of my core lectures to even understand the argument that I'm making. So Mm -hmm. I had um, an opportunity because there are some journalists who have tried to like arrange debates. Um, And I'm always, by the way, willing to have a debate if it's a serious debate about scientific um, reasoning, Not, not not if it's ad hominem or irrelevant. And so I was um, introduced to a real academic virologist, an author of many publications and even a book, who was interested in looking seriously at this issue and and having a debate. And so we had an initial phone call. And in the phone call, it was clear that he hadn't actually read my opinion. So he didn't know what I was saying exactly. I tried to explain it to him briefly on the call, but he needed more time. So I gave him some materials and I said, read this over. And and then think about it, and then let's regroup and see if you still if if you want to debate, or maybe you'll just want to do an interview. <laughs> uh-huh. Like hopefully that he might actually look at the material and see the truth. Yeah. So he looks at the material, and then we reach back out, and this is he's like, 
No, I don't think we we can. De- I can't really debate about that. But here's some articles I can bring up, and I'm like, what? Those articles have nothing to do with proving a virus. I'm like, I only want to discuss experiments that give proof of the existence of the virus. And he's like, well, science doesn't really prove anything. Oh God. Well, you know, there's an old saying, and I'm sure you know of it. It's very hard to change a man's belief system when his paycheck depends on it. And you know, it's, uh, we have another one. That's a big issue today. Never trust a man whose television screen is bigger than his library. And so, you know, we're kind of in this era of superficial, whatever, which is exactly why I wanted to talk to you and reached out to you. And and it's, it's taken us a while to get here due to schedules and everything else. But, you know, when, when I watch your videos, you know, my truth buzzer goes off. I can follow you step by step. And, and that's why I looked into to, uh, Don Lester's and David Parker's book and read the section on virology. And, and what you're talking about reminds me of their discussion on the viruses. I forgot the, I think it was the German physiologist, if I remember right, who also found that there was no proof of the virus and that these research papers came to dead ends. And so he challenged anyone to prove the existence of a virus and some guy, and it was run through like a legal system or something. And this guy produced six papers and they awarded him the winner, but then he rebuttaled against it and ultimately won. But they didn't say a word about the fact that he actually ultimately did win the debate. But when he lost the debate the first round, they publicized the hell out of it. Did you read that section of the book at all? Well, um, I uh, personally know Stefan Lanka, uh, Dr. Lanka, and he's actually a virologist. He discovered um, a so-called giant virus that lives in sea algae earlier in his career. And then he was switching to work on you know, so-called disease-causing viruses. And that's when he discovered that they didn't actually do the right experiments. Because he, he had already done the right experiments because he actually discovered a particle this size that was real. And he studied it, and then he wanted to move on because he, he actually did that because he wanted to do good things for humanity to help with you know diseases. But once he discovered that, you know, he ended up leaving virology because how could he pursue something that he knew was felonious? So he did put out a challenge and there was a legal battle and it did resolve, you know, in the German Supreme Court um, in Dr. Lanka's favor. But, you know, a couple of lessons to learn is one is that, you know, the courts have no business debating science because they don't understand science. And I think that the rulings in that case were more about legal aspects than science. Like the judge did not adjudicate whether virus, the measles virus exists or not. He adjudicated whether Dr. Lanka had to pay this other guy the money for the challenge. I see. And so there were, you know, law issues that were at play. But the even if the court did give that ruling, what you s- said happened with the media is exactly what would have happened anyway, which is that they essentially maligned Dr. Lanka's reputation as much as possible and labeled him an anti-vaxxer, right? And remember, before, even now, anti-vaxxers are somewhat maligned, but before the pandemic, they were kind of thought as kooky. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it would it'd be a quick way to discredit a scientist by giving them that label and it's stuck. And so I've actually even interviewed with some German journalists and they don't want me to mention my association with Dr. Lanka because he's been so smeared in Germany that uh, the the public is tainted about his views. Whereas in the United States, where they they didn't get that propaganda about him, he's you know extremely popular because he has actually done these experiments and you know, about a year ago, he actually worked with an academic virologist who was acting under the cover, um, and they did a control experiment for the so-called virus isolation procedure, and they showed that you can prove the existence of a virus even when you don't have a virus in the experiment at all. Um, mm. And that's, by the way, the third time that that's been shown. Uh, the two other examples were in peer-reviewed publications in the 1950s, um, but they didn't stop virologists from using an invalid experiment 
all these decades. And so Dr. Lanka had to show again that it's still invalid. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you know what and without getting into the details of the virus procedure like you can look at this now now I look at this in a much more simpler way which is that you know just what is science science is the you know study of natural phenomena and their the causes of them right that through scientific of uh, the scientific method scientific experimentation you can um, give evidence to develop a theory that something causes something in nature, right? So for example, you know, what causes uh, thunderstorms? Uh, you know, you could have a theory that, uh, you know, when uh, deer mating season, that whenever the deer mate in, uh, in pairs, that, it's, that, that causes a thunderstorm. And you can design an experiment to test that, right? That you can observe deer mating behaviors and then time when a thunderstorm occurs after the mating, and then you'd find that it actually didn't have a causal relationship, right? But that would be an example of doing an actual scientific experiment. And then, of course, um, you would observe if there are any rain thunderstorms when the deer were not mating. That would be your control. Mm -hmm. So that's how you would conduct a scientific experiment. And the thing that causes the phenomenon is called the independent variable. And that thing, first of all, it has to be a real thing. And then secondly, it has to be independent. So if you're saying deer mating is causing the thunderstorm, right? You have to look at deer mating. You can't look at antelope mating, right? You mm -hmm. can only look at deer mating. So the independent variable, you have to look at some, something that has to really exist and it has to be by itself. And then you say, does it cause the natural phenomena? And of course, in the case of viruses, what we're talking about is a disease. The natural phenomena is you know, getting a cold, a, a flu, a pneumonia, meningitis, arthritis, whatever the illness, right? That's the natural phenomena. We observe people getting that, although it may not be always natural. It could be actually caused by by man, um, by man's, you know, chemicals and radiation and such. But nonetheless, uh, we could consider it at least a natural phenomenon for this discussion. So all you'd need to do to show that a virus causes a disease is one, first show that the virus exists and then have it by itself independent, put it into, you know, a healthy animal the same way that they would, it would get into their body in nature and then show that they get the disease. Very simple. But I'll tell you that, first of all, that experiment has never been done with a virus and it couldn't be done with a virus because they've never done the first part, which they've shown that the virus actually exists. Right. So in other words, what I'm saying is that there's actually no science at all behind viruses, but they say that they exist without using science, and that's the definition of pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is that virology is a pseudoscience. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it, but they're not all created the same. So I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so We've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P A L E O V A L L E Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C H E K 15, to save 15%. There's a couple questions. 
One, I've got a very comprehensive collection of Rudolf Steiner's teachings. I've got about 180 books by Steiner and his initiates and recordings of his lectures. And I've studied a lot of them. And Steiner had some things to say uh, about viral issues. But Steiner's approach, as it's been interpreted by people that are initiates of Steiner's teachings, is that when nature begins to break down for any really reason, with the breakdown of the cells of a living organism is the release of information, which is sometimes referred to as viruses. And Steiner's philosophy of it was that those organisms that are suffering the stress, be it chemical toxicity or overheat or, or uh, you know, fungal in, uh, invasion or whatever it might be, are releasing that information to inform the other creatures in the area so they can upregulate their genes or their internal systems and and therefore adapt. And then um, I watched Bruce Lipton talk about this, and he said that, of course, you know, you have to take his presentation in context because he did use the word virus. He said, look, viruses are not living things. He says the best way to think of a virus is to think of a flash drive. It's not a living thing, but you can plug it into a computer and get information off of it. And he went along the same lines as what Steiner's argument was and said that the viruses moving through the environment are like a software upgrade. And I'm, I'm kind of interpreting it in my own way, but basically, if you don't have the vitality to make the software upgrade, then it can make you sick. And the analogy I've used to kind of make a correlate to that is if you take a software program, say for, you know, edition 16 for my Mac and try to put it into a Mac that's 10 years old, it'll probably crash the system because it won't be able to either have the random access memory or any, many of the other factors that are involved. So point being is that the software can either upregulate the system or it can crash the system. Um, what are your thoughts on things like exosomes? Because I've heard so Sayer G talking a lot about exosomes and as viral particles or information. Is there any way to weave that concept together as an environmental factor where maybe a virus is being used as a name that should be something else in your lexicon? Well, um, you know, let me first say that you know, of course, what the reason I'm here and what my, the major contribution that I made so far, right, is taking the narrative of the mainstream medical and scientific establishment and just scrutinizing the actual scientific experiments, you know, using logic and reason and showing how what they've done is, you know, complete BS and it's not science at all. And any of their conclusions are false. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> within the alternative truth community, it's critical that we don't, in turn, go and make up false stories and spread them around like they do. Mm -hmm. And almost everything you said just now has no evidence behind it whatsoever. It's just a story. There's no evidence that these particles contain information or pass information. Mm -hmm. That's just someone's guess, someone's story about it. I think the word is speculation. Whatever. I'm not interested in speculation. I'm only interested in how things really work, what's really the truth. Mm -hmm. So we do know that when cells are you know, aggravated by those things you mentioned, by poisons, radiation, um, et cetera, that they do break down into small particles. But we have no idea what those particles are. They could, you know, there are different theories. There is a theory that they're just sacks of garbage, mm -hmm. which makes sense because if the cell released its contents into the blood or into the tissue, it would destroy and damage surrounding cells. So you would want to package it up. But so that kind of makes sense, but we don't know for with certainty that that's the reason either. And we we know that sometimes in the particles, they may contain different kinds of materials, but they're just materials that are in the cell. So are they for a function or are they just for disposal? Right. And we have no idea. 
Now, mm -hmm. it's really problematic to use the word virus unless you mean what is most commonly meant by virus, which is a you know replication competent nanoparticle that is not alive that is invades organisms and causes disease. So if you're talking about and using the word virus and that's not what you mean, all you're going to do is confuse people. And I yeah. think you know some of Steiner work, Steiner's work is confusing for that reason. But the thing is, when he wrote this, that definition of a virus didn't exist because that only came about after the alleged discovery of DNA and the double helix. In his time, right, he, they couldn't even see these particles under a microscope because the electron microscope hadn't in, been invented until about 1930, although he may still have been uh, writing at that time, but I'm not sure if they, these writings predated that or not. No, but he died. Then, he died in 1925. Then, right. So that was right before the electron microscope. So these particles that you know they now refer to as viruses under the electron microscope, he wouldn't have been able to see those in any detail under a light microscopes that were available at the time. You can you can see the cell disintegrate into particles, but they essentially just look like specks. You can't. Uh, resolve any detail of their structure. And then with an electron microscope, we've got to be seriously question anything we see from an electron microscope because you have to essentially, you know, do extreme things to that tissue before you can visualize it. Like you pulverize it, you heat it, you freeze it, you dehydrate it, all these things. If, yeah. if we put you through that, you know, you wouldn't look like you look now. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't even recognize me. Yes, I understand exactly. that line so, of thinking. Right. So, you know, so we really, um, I, I think it's premature that we don't have sufficient knowledge to say that there are any of these particles that have any significance in terms of our health uh, or physiology, other than it's just, you know, you could think of it, well, it's just a way that to dispose of dead cell debris because you know we see that's kind of evident from the observation that the cell dies and it goes into these things, but we really don't know anything else beyond that. Um, and certainly, there's no evidence that it's involved in in any kind of disease process at all, other yes. than the result. The result of so a couple of questions that come up um, before we move on to the other ones I wrote down is. Um, what is the mechanism, in your opinion, of sexually transmitted diseases that are attributed to viruses? Because we know STDs are real. I've worked with many patients uh, suffering from them and even done healing ceremonies for some of them. And, um, you know, that, that there's an example of something that... It, it, the, there is something going on there. I mean, sexually transmitted diseases certainly are real things. Paul, I'm not. Uh, I'm not denying the reality of any disease in terms of people suffering or afflicted with symptoms. That would be preposterous. I mean, I'm a doctor. Yeah, right? I've seen uh, illness all the time. It's what I'm saying is that the the theory put forth that it, these illnesses are caused by germs is simply false. There's simply no credible evidence that shows that relationship or that causality. And in the case of viruses, there's actually no research that shows the viruses actually even exist at all. Mm -hmm. So whatever causes those diseases, and by the way, I, I, I would say also there's not evidence that they're sexually transmitted either. Uh, I see. They are, they are diseases of the sex organs, mm -hmm. right? But there's no scientific evidence or observation that under scrutiny that they're actually transmitted sexually. In fact, if you look at the epidemiology, you, it's practically impossible that it's transmitted sexually. Like, in other words, the patterns uh, on a, a population scale. Uh, but, of course, you know, people individually have the experience that one partner has this and then the other partner has it or they have it uh, around the same time. And what they don't realize is that if you're uh, having a sexual partner, most likely you're doing a lot of things together. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so if you do the same thing, it could cause the same problem in both your bodies. Yeah. And, you know, we never look at that possibility, mm -hmm. right? But when they've done lots of experiments taking fluid from a, you know, a chicken pox blister, a herpes blister, injected in animals, put it on their skin, make cuts in their skin, put it on there. The only thing that happens is they get a little wound from putting toxic waste material on an open wound. <laughs> yeah. But they don't ever get the same disease. So it doesn't transfer that way. That's not what happens. Something else happens. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly what happens. I have some uh, guesses, some hypotheses, but uh, they haven't been tested because every research grant goes towards funding the study of, of fake viruses. It doesn't go, you know, why would anyone study the real cause of a sexually transmitted disease, supposedly? when it's already been determined. Right. right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, that I have um, known several individuals, um, some of who have worked with me, some of who work with Dr. Jennifer Daniels, who had recurrent genital herpes outbreaks, right, where they had blisters in their genital region. And of course, you know, nobody wants that. And through a process of doing some general cleansing, detox and supplementing with collagen rich foods, they stopped having herpes outbreaks. Mm -hmm. Now those, you know, those in changes obviously have nothing to do with viruses. There's no viral drug. There's no vaccine. There's no antibody therapy, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are just ge the general thing that kind of people get better from everything when they do some cleansing. Right, um, And it's the same thing with that. So most mm -hmm. likely, and I, of course, I don't have an experiment to show this causation, but my guess is that it's caused by a toxins. And the reason you associate it with sex is because when you have a lot of sex, like, you know, and this often happens, I heard so many stories, they have a new boyfriend, a new girlfriend, and then they become sexually active. And when you have a new partner, it's like, you're really excited and, you know, you're going to go probably more often, more frequently. And when you do that, especially, by the way, with modern procedures, so like women that are taking contraceptions and have don't have sufficient secretions, men who have been circumcised and don't have the proper lubrication of the glands penis, though, that causes additional trauma during the, the intercourse. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not like trauma where you're going to be, you know, gushing blood, or you're going to have open sores. Mm -hmm. It's at the microscopic level right? Yeah. Micro tears, right? And micro traumas. Yeah. And that's going to draw your immune system. And then your immune system will bring toxins, if you're overloaded with toxins, to the site of the injury. And this is happens, you know, this pattern of disease happens quite frequently that there's a, some kind of physical event that draws an immune response. And it could be running a marathon, it could be having a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a trauma. And yep. then the body translocates these stored toxins that it's overloaded to the injury site, and then serious disease manifests. Right. The other thing in the regard to the sexually transmitted diseases, if, if one person's quite toxic and they're having sex with another, there's a lot of transfer of fluids in sex. So, you know, what I'm saying is someone who's very toxic can be actually increasing the toxicity in their partner who then has a reaction to the toxic burden that they've just taken on through the sex interactions. Well, that, you know, that's certainly is theoretically possible. But remember, the fluids are actually not going inside the body. They're going into body cavities that are technically outside of the body, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about like, you know, semen, vaginal secretions, saliva, yeah. right? So those are going to enter, right? They're going to enter the vagina. They might enter the rectum. They might enter the, the mouth and mm -hmm. possibly even nose, right? So I'm just trying to cover the gamut. Yeah. Now, all those places are outside the body and the mm -hmm. body can easily expel any toxins that come into those areas just mm -hmm. by increasing secretions. Like in, and in, for example, in the, in the saliva, right, there are antibodies that can bind up foreign substances that enter the mouth. 
So I think if they're, you know, it's quite possible that if you are highly toxic, that in your genital secretions or in your seminal fluid, that there might be some expression of toxins. Although the body may have mechanisms to prevent that. I mean, I haven't seen any studies where they actually tested, you know, seminal fluid or semen for toxins or vaginal fluid. Certainly the products that come out during menstruation, we know would have high amounts of toxins, but I'm not sure if the sexual related secretions, but that's an interesting thing to look at. Um, but, you know, but still, you know, it's like the body, I don't think it's likely to cause a serious problem, but it could certainly absorb into the local tissues and maybe create some irritation or some kind of response. This would be the kind of experiment that you could, you know, you could easily do by collecting the fluids and then, you know, putting them in a healthy host and see if just the fluid by itself causes any illness. Well, yeah, not to belabor it, but the other issue that immediately comes to my mind is microtrauma, um, small areas where they're actually bleeding. And, you know, you're, you can, you're, you're getting past mucous membranes if you get into the bloodstream, which is why injecting a vaccine right into your blood is a problem because if it was coming through your mouth, your nose, or anywhere where you have immunoglobulin A in high concentrations, et cetera, you'd have a protective barrier. But when the, once they put it right into your bloodstream, you basically are bypassing your defense system. So, you, you know, I've had enough wild sex to know that blood can happen and traumas can happen. And, uh, you know, so there might be a mechanism there, but um, I, I, you've given me a, 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 and everyone listening, a very good answer. It's not really that I need to probe that any deeper. I'm just thinking as you're talking, Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've heard me talk about the many injuries I've had doing many wild things from racing motocross to riding in the rodeo and crashing stock cars and being a paratrooper. And one of the things that's really helped me a lot to make my joints more comfortable and heal is collagen. And Bioptimizers has just come out with an amazing new product called Collagenius that actually goes way beyond anything we can get in the standard collagen supplementation classification. And I've got Mark Effinger here, who's the chief product officer at Bioptimizers, to tell us about their new product, which I'm very excited about. Mark, tell us what's unique about Collagenius. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, I, and I really appreciate this, by the way. So Collagenius came about um, as an accident of my lab assistant trying to compartmentalize different mushroom extracts from one to one all the way to a hundred to one. These are all medicinal mushrooms and they're all organic. And we were finding this really interesting overtone of chocolate and cacao coming out of these mushroom extracts. And the more extraction we got, the further we got down the extraction lane, the higher the, the chocolate notes would come out of these. So me being a, a, a more of a scientist, I was trying to cap these things. She being more of an incredible chef decided that what if we could flavor these up and us both being over 50 and me having some of the same experiences you have in breaking bones and tearing muscles and tendons <laughs> decided, wouldn't it be great if we could, if we could take the, the benefits of collagen and the restorative and, and tissue repair and combine it with these micronutrients that are available in mushrooms that activate the collagen and make it bioavailable. So we started blending those things up. And as a result, we came up with this nootropic, this brain enhancing mushroom stack that is also a super collagen enhancer. And those together became Collagenius. That's so amazing. I just love the exploration. I love the marriage of your wife's chef skills and your science skills. And that's just the magic of a healthy relationship. And that really describes my relationship with Bioptimizer. It's just magical because I love all their products. I, I've always had a great relationship with Wade. And I love it because everything Bioptimizer's sells actually works. What a concept. So, hey, you guys, get your Collagenius at N-O-O-T-O-P-I-A. That's newtopia.com forward slash living number four. And the letter D, that's newtopia.com forward slash living 4D. And get your discount with Paul 10 on checkout. I can't wait to hear what you think about Collagenius. Enjoy. A couple of things I want to get to before we run out of time is what do you think the um, 
long-term implications of generating spike proteins in the body are after inoculations? Do you think we're uh, still, we, the story is still going to unfold as to what's happened to all these vaccinated people? Well, you know, if we if we just look at the prior vaccine technology, we know that there are substantial long-term health effects. So we don't have to look at the ingredients or how it works to, to you know, hypothesize and actually be guarantee that we have a probably a 99% probability of being correct that there are going to be longer term um, effects, health, adverse health effects. But there's, there's actually no clear evidence that recipients of these injections actually make the spike protein. So Is that despite, right? That's like, very interesting. Yeah, I know. Just if you were thinking, you know, like about this, and you're saying, "All right, I'm a company. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, make this gene therapy that's gonna induce the recipient to make the spike protein or any protein." The first thing I want to know is when I inject it into them, do they actually make that thing? So I would do studies, and a very simple study to do. Yeah. So why don't we see this data anywhere? Well, I've heard Judy Mikovits talk about it a lot, and, and the, the concept of the spike protein is almost every one of the names I just gave you a minute ago is people that tout the virus are all speaking like this. You know, and, and, and this is bringing up a, a real important issue here. You realize that what you're doing a very good job at is showing that nobody knows what the fucking hell is going on. And that a lot of people's lives are being radically changed. People are being censored, erased, um, traumatized, and everything you already know about when really what we have in the military, we call this a snafu. Are you familiar with the term? Yeah, yeah. Situation normal, all fouled up, right? Uh, fucked up. And if you look in Webster's Dictionary uh, or any big dictionary, it actually tells you exactly that. It's it's in the dictionary. And, and having been in the military, I used to go crazy because it's like nobody knows what the hell's going on. Nobody knows why we're being sent off to kill people. Everybody's just stupid enough to do it, which is why I had to get the hell out of there. But, you know, this this is really a problem because they're using this against us and the people that we trust as doctors based on exactly what you're saying are seem to be as lost and confused but believing in their own variation of it and so we really have dragons fighting dragons and people getting caught in between and their lives are confused and nobody knows who the hell to believe and it's causing families to be broken up it's causing friendships to be broken um, and it's causing people to run out and get themselves inoculated with God knows only what in the name of trying to protect people and and all the whole story, you know. And so it we, we really have a, a clusterfuck here, and it's dangerous. <laughs> and and uh, you know, and um, it, it, I you know, there, before we end, I want to say. Two things. One, I know you've just released a movie on terrain. I think terrain is everything. That's why my four doctors, I also teach six foundation principles, nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement. So I have six foundation principles and four doctors. I re the reason I have the four doctors is because I had to categorize values and where you need to put your awareness and the six foundation principles are woven into those four doctors because without those I don't, you know, these people can argue all they want. I'm a 60 year old man. I'm still as healthy and fit as young professional athletes. And I prove it to them all the time and it scares the shit out of them. And they ask me, what drugs are you using? I say, I'm eating organic food and following my own teachings, which is have a dream. So you don't need a crisis, manage your movement intelligently, eat real food from real soil and get enough sleep and have time to work within yourself and have a spiritual practice or you're going to be somebody's patient or worse. And I think that's the foundation of health. And I've had 38 years to explore every kind of messed up patient with every kind of disease and problem you can imagine. And it always comes back. If you don't get those things in place, you're just going to be a very good uh, supplement to the medical system's financial uh, register. So, the two things I'd like to hear before you go is 
Anything you want to share about your movie terrain so that people realize the importance of that right now? Because we could have talked for 20 hours on those issues. And I'd like to close with considering everything we've talked about and what's going on in the world, what are your solutions for people? What are the, what are a few things that if you were talking to your 16, 17 year old kids that were on their way out into the world by themselves right now, what would you say to them so that they don't fall into the trap of what's going on? Well, you you better start before they're seventeen. <laughs> well, I, I, I but, figured. Uh, that, no, you know, no, I get what you're saying. You're right. I, I you're have right. I have a 41 year old with a grandson. I have a three year old little girl who's just about to turn three uh, next month, and I have a six year old boy. So I'm dealing with this all the way up to 41 years of age, all the way down to three years of age, and I'm a 60 year old man, and I my way of protecting my kids is we farm organically. We grow our own food as much as possible. We buy from local organic farmers and I live the six foundation principles and four doctors. And that's my teachings for my kids. And I will leave behind me a shitload of interviews with you and others to say, you need to listen to these people because you have to learn to think for yourself. And these are people that learned how to do that. And if you don't learn to think for yourself, you're going to become somebody else's pincushion, play toy, and financial uh, resource. Well, those are really the same, you know, kind of values. And uh, you know, I'm fortunate uh, in a, a sense about this current pandemic situation because it enabled me to transition my kids to homeschooling, yes. where I could, you know, kind of make this the really, you know, the overall. Uh, part of their formal education, right? And uh, be much more involved in raising them. And it's worked out that way. It's incredible experience. And um, yeah, those are exactly the kind of things that, you know, it's your responsibility to think for yourself, to question everything, to seek the truth, um, that there are a lot of, you know, forces in there that would take advantage of you or have you act against your own, you know, self interest. Um, but also, you know, like what, going over what's important, like there's other traps in our culture, like greed or fame or, you know, these kinds of things. And to, you know, and I try to set an example as much as I can, you know, of how you can, you know, live your life in, um, you know, a better way in a way that's, uh, you know, closer to God in a way that's closer to nature, um, that's more peaceful, that more you can balanced. Show Yes, exactly. And we have a lot of discussions about this and they know that their family and their upbringing is very different <laughs> from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the kids down the street who are in the public school. And I think they, they actually really appreciate that and feel like they have an advantage when they do step out independently. And I also think it's important that they have some practical experience before they go out on the, their own, that they have the experience of starting and running their own company. Mm -hmm. Of course, it can be a very small venture, but something that they do. And they should have the experience of, you know, interning with someone who they, they want mentorship from, right? Um, you know, whether it be in their community or, or somewhere else uh, to kind of look through those lenses of a mentor, you know, other than the parents, to right. provide, mm -hmm. to provide that, um, you know, experience. And there should be some ability to, you know, see different cultures and different geographies in the world to get a sense of perspective that, you know, you are not on an island, uh, but part of a, a bigger uh, thing and start to think on that, you know, larger scale. And, you know, I'm trying to do this not just for my children, but also to sort of, you know, um, do this for a larger community, you know, of, of people who want to remain free and responsible and who pursue, you know, spiritual growth that um, trying to develop an infrastructure for education and training of people into, you know, the exact principles that you outlined uh, I don't formulate them because that's, you know, your personal way, but really we cover almost all of the same aspects related to 
um, you know, regaining and maintaining health and vitality, because those are simply the objective things that one needs to do to achieve those goals. And yes. of course, there's minor variations and styles and, you know, uh, you know, you can uh, eat one thing and, you know, you eat almonds and I, I'll eat uh, um, cashews or whatever, right? Those minor differences. But really, this is a, a way of living that brings you closer to nature and helps you continue to make progress, you know, throughout your life and set an example. And that's what I try to impart on my children and the people who come to me for education and the people who come to me for consultation. And so it's, it's really about getting back to these important values and a, a much more natural way of living how we were intended to and reestablish those connections and set up the conditions for your children to do that, for your uh, partners and friends to do that, and, and for really all of humanity to do that, you know, through, um, you know, we don't have to reach all of humanity through our projects, but the resonance that we put out will permeate through sure. all of that. And right. And so mm -hmm. the, the project of terrain is along those lines. It's, you know, to set out to show, first of all, the scientific fallacies of, of virology to, show how that has impacted humanity, that the struggle that we've had to face and how governments and industry has used that to their advantage and our expense, and then how we can transition to this truer paradigm where we can really actually become healthy through our own actions, not mm -hmm. dependent on some system, not dependent on being tortured with knives and syringes and probes right? But simply through movement, drinking water, right? Eating the, the right actual whole natural real foods that nature intended, right? Not synthetic chemicals or refined parts of actual foods, right? And, and how we um, have our spiritual or religious practice, right? That where we find the deeper meaning and spend time in contemplation, um, and of course, the productive pursuit that we, uh, and this is, you know, perhaps more important for men than women, right? Although there, of course, is individual overlap that for some women, this may be more important than others, but to have, make a contribution to the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, through your, you know, profession, through your effort, through your work, your expertise, your skill. Yes. And that provides meaning as well. And I'm not talking about going and sitting on an assembly line and, you know, screwing caps on a container no. eight hours a day, right? I'm talking about something uh, real that's your real contribution, a meaningful contribution to, to the world, to humanity. And if we all reestablish these ways of living, Right then, we won't be unduly influenced by these evil forces. We'll be practically impenetrable. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, I think that's right? true. I attribute my own life. I was raised on a functional working farm where we had to produce, and you learned how business works. If you don't take care of the animals and the plants, you starve to death, and you have no money. And you know, it was a very down in the dirt, real experience and i learned a hell of a lot there and um i think it's it's been great to talk to you um you know you're an interesting guy because you're kind of like mercurius you know the the god mercury which is very volatile in that you know the the problem with someone like you is the more you realize how much truth you're telling, the more you realize how completely in big trouble we are and how deep it goes and how paradoxically simple the solutions are. So it's kind of like God. God's wickedly simple, but wickedly complicated and everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And all these amazing paradoxes. This is why Osho said, you'll never understand God if you can't handle a paradox. And so, um, you know, my, my dream for having you on was that people would get a chance to hear some sound step-by-step -step logic 
which you gave very well, and that you would realize that that people would realize that there's a lot of of misunderstandings, charades, and a lot of financial endeavors going on that really have nothing to do at all with people keeping people healthy, and 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 that is a you know a problem, but that it was beautiful that we came back to where I think you and I have a real agreement and it it's natural principles. It's, you know, living from your heart, adding something to the world, not being a cog in the wheel, thinking for yourself and, and realizing that there is something beyond what our minds can perceive. That's ultimately the source of everything. And, and that's a personal exploration, but that too should be your own personal exploration. That shouldn't be something that you have drilled into your head by some belief system or you, or you, you might as well go get your vaccination because you're in the same problem. Now you're just getting a psychic vaccination instead of a physical one. So I'm very, very grateful for what you're doing. And um, I'm grateful that you're, you have a lot of material out there because of all the people that I can listen to. Whenever I see your name come up, I jump right to it because you are somebody that is rational, logical, and that I, my truth buzzer goes off. You know, I'm like, okay, I can listen to this guy because he's not trying to make money off people. He's not trying to sell anything. He cares enough about people to tell the truth. And he cares enough about people to put his whole name and his career at risk because guys like you are the first ones they go after. And so when I see somebody in your position who has the smarts to really make billions of dollars tricking people, but doing the opposite, then I say, pay close attention because there is a real wise man present. And part of the problem is we've lost, people have lost their ability to discern wisdom when they hear from, hear it from bullshit. And, and so thank you for coming on the show. I think my listeners are going to be deeply grateful and I am deeply grateful. And I just want you to know that my my heart and my love and my appreciation are with you every step of the way. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, very generous of you. And uh, it's great to experience this level of solidarity and know that, uh, you know, I'm not alone because sometimes it is very lo lonely doing this kind of work when everyone else is so um, indoctrinated and, uh, you know, in a, in a different, really in a different reality. And uh, being part of these communities and coming together is really key, um, you know, for us to stay motivated and on point. Thank you. Thank you to my sponsors for all your love and support and your amazing products and your sustainable practices. Thank you to all of you. Please share this episode with everybody you think it'll be a benefit to. And as you've heard Dr. Kaufman say, it boils down to some real, honest, natural principles and contributing to the world and getting yourself healthy enough to be a real contributor and using your mind and having rational discernment, not just believing anything you hear because a bunch of people are repeating it. So lots of love to all of you. I look forward to sharing another great episode with you soon. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Andrew Kaufman. You can sign up for Dr. Andy's free newsletter at andrewkaufmanmd.com, which is also where you can request a private consultation. You can find him on Facebook at Andrew Kaufman MD or join him on Rumble for free live stream events, rumble.com forward slash Andrew Kaufman MD. Join the Medicamentum Authentica Telegram group at t.me forward slash Medicamentum Authentica. The True Medicine Library, an archive of information and resources to promote health and medical freedom, can be found at truemedicinelibrary.com. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at czechinstitute.com forward slash podcast. 
And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.